Hey guys and welcome back to a new video. In this video, just very quickly, three clean code hacks that are universally applicable and where I bet that you didn't know at least two of them. Number one, did you ever have something like this? Here we have an interface photo uploader with obviously a function to upload a photo in form of a bytes array and it will return a result of type string. And that is already the part where the code is not super readable here. In fact, what this function should return is the resulting URL after that photo was uploaded. Totally valid and a URL is just a normal string. But how can we communicate that to the caller? So how does the caller know that this string really represents the URL? Because here we can't really have a variable name or so. And since a URL is just a string, we need to use string here, right? No, in this case, we can make use of a so-called type alias. So we can say we have a type alias here called photo URL, and we just set that to string. So we just define a new alias for string, which you can then use to indicate that this is a result of type photo URL. And we still just normally wrap a string inside of such a result, but with this type alias, we just make clear that the result here is really a URL that points to a photo. And whenever you have a problem like this, you can just use a type alias. So type aliases aren't only to make complex types more simple. That is, of course, also something you could do if you have a very complex uh, map type here or so. Then you can also use a type alias to make that map clearer. But you can also use that to just give simple types a clear name so everyone knows what that type now represents in this specific context. Clean code Kotlin hack and number two. If we take a look here, I have a data class user, which consists of an ID, a name, and an is online boolean. So we can think of maybe a chat app where certain users might be online and other users might not be online. And we then have a user util.kt file where we might have a function to message online users. We pass in a list of all users in a certain chat room, for example, and a message we want to broadcast to all these users. And maybe we also want to do something else to all non-online users, maybe leave some other form of message to them. So what we could use is the partition function of Kotlin, which takes a look at these users in room list and partitions it based on this condition, in this case is online. So we have one part of the list of all online users and the other part of the list of all offline users. And what we then get back is a pair of type list of user and list of users. So this first half of this pair or the left side of the pair will represent the online users and this list will represent the offline users. But a pair itself has the disadvantage that it's not really readable because when we have such a pair, we need to refer to first to get the left side of the pair and to second to get the right side of the pair. But if we see something like that in code, it doesn't really reveal what the first side or the second side is. So we don't really know if we just read this, are these now the online users or the offline users? We always need to go through all the code, take a look at the partition function, and then do the logic in our brain ourselves to understand what this loop really goes through. And whenever you have such a pair in Kotlin, what you can use is destructuring. So if such a function returns a pair or you're actively creating a pair, you can instead get the two results like this and directly put these inside of variables. So online users and offline users. That works totally fine. We can then take the online users and just replace them here. Online users, we loop over them and now it's much clearer. And down here, we can then do something else with the offline users. So the code is just much more readable by using destructuring. And this, by the way, also works with maps, for example. So if you have a um, map here, map off, just an empty map, let's say you map string keys to integer values and you then want to loop over all entries of that map, what you can do is you can say map that for each and here you destructure these key and value pairs and then you can directly refer to the key, which is a string or the value, which is an integer. So destructuring just adds a lot of readability if you have a certain scenario which uh, is comparable to this one here. And coming to clean code hack number three, let's take a look here. I am inside of main activity and here I am initializing a shared preferences object. And then if we want to save a field in shared preferences, we can do it like this. Shared preferences that edit that put string. Let's say we want to save a token. The token's value is hello world and we call apply. And if we then want to read the token, we can get the token like this. So val token is shared preferences that get string. We pass in the key of that token and the default value if it doesn't exist. And we effectively get a nullable string here. So far, so good. But 
Actually, all you really want to do with shared preferences here is to change a single string value. But doing so is quite complex. So whenever you want to change it, you need to call this long line of code. Whenever you want to read it, you need to call this. Isn't there a better way to do this? Yes, there is. There is the option to use a so-called property delegate here. Because with a property delegate, you can override the getter and the setter of a simple property. So the simple property could just be the normal string token here. And by overriding the setter, you could define that whenever you just call the normal setter, which you would call if you say token is equal to something else, whenever you call that, you instead call this line instead of just assigning a new value to that token normally. And you can also override the getter. So whenever you read this token, for example, you say print line, and you want to print this token, then obviously the value of this token needs to be read. In that case, instead of just reading it normally, you can say that reading it looks like this to get it from shared preferences. And you can always make use of such property delegates when setting and getting a value is much more complex than just assigning a new value to a simple variable. Let's quickly go through how this will look like in code here under hack three. I want to create a new Kotlin class called oops, shared preferences delegate, for example. This will be a class and in the constructor, we will pass the context which we need to create the shared preferences object. We can then also pass in the name of the property. So this would be uh, the, the key of this shared preferences field. So token, for example. And we could pass in a default value of type string, for example. So in case the key, uh, the key doesn't exist. And then the magic happens when we make that implement the read write property interface. This one here. The first generic parameter here refers to the class in which this property can be used. Typically, this is equal to any, so we can just use this uh, delegate wherever we want. The second type refers to the return value. So in this case, we have a string field, but we could also work with the generics here to make this work with integers, with longs as well. You can see now we need to override a few functions. We can hit Command I or Control I to implement both these functions, get value and set value. And with these functions, we can now override the get and set logic of this specific shared preferences field. So if we go to main activity and cut this shared preferences initialization out, put it in here, of course, we need to now refer to the context, context at shared preferences. And now we have access to that. So when we get a value, we want to return shared preferences dot get string. And we just pass in the name here and the default value. And if that's null, we return the default value. And in set value, we do exactly the same as we did in main activity as well. So we say share preferences that edit that put string key is name and the value is this new value that we get here. And then we can call it apply to actually apply the changes. And typically we also add a little helper function which makes using this delegate a little bit more convenient. We can do this here function context that shared preferences. And in here we just pass in the name. So the key. I'll leave the default value blank for now. And we just set this to the shared preferences delegate, pass in this for the context and the name from this parameter. And the magic now happens in main activity when we want to use this. So instead of all this here, we can say private val token by shared preferences. And here we just need to pass in the key. And let's actually make this a var, otherwise we can't change it. What we can now do is we can treat this token as a normal variable. This is just a normal string now. But the logic when changing or reading from the token is completely different compared to a normal variable because we effectively override this logic in here because if we read the value, then this code will be executed instead. If we set the value, this code will be executed instead. So if we go ahead in here and want to change the token, we can just say token is equal to hello world and this change will be applied to shared preferences as well. If we want to read it, that works just like before as well. So we can just delete these lines and you will also notice if we execute this app, take a look here, oh, we actually don't need to see anything, um, but right now we should obviously see something or oh, I need to update the target SDK. Let's quickly go through um, build that Gradle app, update compile and target SDK to 34, synchronize this, go back to main activity, relaunch this, if we then take a look in our logcat and search for hello world, that is what we expect that it prints now. 
There it is. Obviously, we just set that value here. But if we now remove this token, so we don't set it as explicitly before, it should now still print hello world because we save that in shared preferences. So if we relaunch this, take a look here, go to logcat. There we go, or a second hello world log, because that change from before now was really saved in shared preferences. And I want to highlight that this shared preferences thing really was just an example. So with this hack, I just want to encourage you that whenever you have a very complex setter and getter of a property, you can make use of these delegates to make your code a lot cleaner because this is obviously much more readable than what we had before. And this, by the way, is exactly the same, which we also use in Compose all the time. So we might have a private var state and then we use by mutable state and just assign some form of value here. I'll enter to import that. And then what we can now do is we can simply go ahead and say, uh, not val, but just state plus plus, because state is now an integer directly rather than a state of type integer. So on the flip side, if we would have a private var state two, for example, and set this equal to mutable state off, so not by mutable state, but equal, then this wouldn't work like that. So if we say state two plus plus, we do get an error here because state two is now a mutable state of type integer and not just an integer anymore. Because if we would want to increase that state two like the first state, we would need to refer to state two dot value plus plus. And all this delegate just makes sure is that we don't always need to refer to the value of the state, but can rather access the property directly. But the setter of this delegate would then just increase the state's value under the hood, so we don't need to see that on our own. So I hope you learned something new here and there were some hacks for you that you didn't know yet. If so, then did you ever think about how many clean code hacks you would learn if we would work together? Because that is exactly what happens in my 10 week Android mentorship program, where we'll be working together very closely to eliminate all your technical doubts and struggles to make you a really solid industry ready Android developer. If that sounds good to you, you will find all further details about that mentorship program down below. First link in this video's description where you can also apply for this. Other than that, thanks so much for watching this video. See you back in the next one. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye bye.